This is Moments of Truth, the webcast with and for customer success professionals. I'm your host, Andrew Marks, co-founder of Success Hacker, and today I'm joined by Josh Zamora. Josh is a veteran of the customer success space and has been privileged to lead multiple teams of customer success professionals in his career. He currently serves as the Director of Customer Advocacy at ServiceNow, a $6 billion public company providing cloud-based solutions that define, structure, manage, and automate enterprise operations for more than 6,500 companies globally. He's a natural collaborator and connector, working hard to highlight the successes of his teams on behalf of their customers. Passionate about the customer success role wherever he goes, Josh is a strong evangelist for the value of human relationships and their power to build lasting outcomes in business, which is probably why I really like this guy. He is based in San Diego, where he spends his time enjoying time with his family and the beautiful Southern California experience. Josh, welcome to the program, and thanks for making time for me today. Thanks, Andrew. Really appreciate the time as well. Looking awesome. forward to it. How's the weather down there? Is it nice in San Diego? You know what? It's a little warm for our taste, but we're kind of weather weather wusses are out here, so it's hard for us to complain to anybody else. A little warm for your taste. So what? 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 T tell me about the temperature today. I think today we're experiencing some monsoon weather, so yeah. we're actually getting something in the order of 90, 90 degrees, oh. which is. Uh, not too bad it's the humidity that's it's the humidity bad. right it's all the humidity yeah exactly exactly yeah i'm up here day, so. i'm up here outside of sacramento and it's hot and dry oh yeah so, uh anyways all right well hey listen so i thought we'd start our discussion today talking about imposter syndrome oh, because yeah. it can happen to anyone that 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 feeling of doubt that one can get about their abilities which can leave you with this feeling that you're a fraud. Yep. Now, now, prior to ServiceNow, you held a number of customer-focused leadership positions at uh, Animetrix, Insighton, at Altrix. Uh, but before taking on this later uh, latest leadership role at ServiceNow, you took an individual contributor role. And, and that was probably a bit damaging to the ego. So starting again in this new management role after that IC role, did you feel a bit of that imposter syndrome creeping in? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that there's, it's a funny thing that happens with imposter syndrome, right? You know, your, you know, your worth, you know, what you can do, you know, what you're ca uh, capable of, but in the moment, walking into a situation where it feels like maybe you're, you've taken a couple steps back or you feel like maybe you're not uh, worthy of whatever that you've been given, uh, it really is easy to let that mental game kind of just eat away at your confidence. And certainly coming into service now and even uh, going into the individual contributor role, um, there was some, there was plenty of imposter syndrome that went along with that and feeling like, huh, did I make the right decision? Am I, am I the right person for this role? Is this really the thing that I should be doing? Or maybe I, I need to go and give it up and go do something completely different. So how did you, so how, how did it, how does it creep up? How does it manifest itself? And then, and then what do you, what do you do to, to address it, to deal with it? Cause I, I could, I could see, especially, I mean, you, you did this, you did this in the middle of COVID, didn't you? Or was it just before COVID that you? So I, yeah, so I started ServiceNow a week, a week and a half or so before COVID actually hit. Right. And uh, basically what, what that entailed was that I started, uh, was working in the office, planning out some trips to go and visit other customers, uh, visit customers, visit other team members. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and we all got sent home. So that was an immediate sort of like, it's just a crazy sort of situation to walk into, right? Right. Um, not that I could have planned it or not that anybody, of any of us ever looked for that. It didn't help uh, though. It didn't, it, it doesn't didn't, help, it didn't help at all, right? Not at all, not at all. Um, but what was kind of interesting was that once we got to that point where like, all right, this is the reality of our situation at the moment. 
um, then you start dealing with isolation. You start dealing with the fact that I'm by myself and now I've, I don't have anyone to collaborate with. And like you mentioned earlier, right? I love collaborating. I love dealing with people. I love the interactions that happen when you're in a good sort of situation like that. And with COVID, it really kind of took all of that dynamic way. And you're kind of left thinking, well, all right, who am I going to depend on? Who am I actually going to rely on? And I remember telling my uh, my boss at that point in time, I'm like, I, I don't know who's who in the zoo. I don't know who I'm supposed to be talking to. I don't understand where my role is going to fit. And uh, thankfully enough, I, I had a really good, not just a good mentor in my manager, but also a good sponsor. And I think that that helped, right? Everyone that talks about pulling themselves out of imposter syndrome, somehow, for whatever reason, seems to forget the fact that um, there's there's no you don't do this by yourself, right? There's there's always the help that you get from others that is going to be a critical piece of this. Yeah, and I think that's important, right? You you, you yeah. if you're if you're you're facing this, if you're feeling this, this creeping up on you, the worst thing that you can do is keep it to yourself. That's right. Yeah, and I I think isolation kills, right? So we we create these isolated mindsets in our minds where we're basically saying i'm the only one that's going through this no one's ever had to experience the same sort of pain or frustration or annoyance um and then that isolation becomes a it, it's a weird sort of thing right it becomes a crutch that you rely on because there's no one else that understands you the way that you understand you but then it also it, it creates a wall around you that basically says no one's ever going to understand and that's a dangerous place to be um, because you don't allow other people to come in and actually help you out. Right. And it's a slippery slope, but see, that was made even more challenging once again, uh, with the whole COVID situation. I mean, I, oh. one of the first things that I would do going into a company and I, I experienced imposter syndrome, you know, sometimes moving from one company to another in a, in a, in a parallel position, yeah. you know, like, okay, do I, do I, you know, do I really, am I really prepared to take on this? This, this next step in my own career journey, but a big part of kind of overcoming uh, that is being able to sit down with your people, with your peers, face yeah. to face, you know, and having that that time together so you can get wrap your arms around what's going on. And, and so that that isolation from COVID was was particularly challenging. That was definitely painful. And, and I think it's it's funny, right? So I outside of COVID, there's the moment that we start thinking about um, imposter syndrome in the context of like, we look at our own blooper reels and then compare them to other people's highlight reels. And that, that the danger of that is that we never give ourselves enough credit for the things that we're actually good at. So you asked a little bit earlier about some of the things that I did personally. Um, I had to look back and really re, reassert the fact that I know what I'm doing. Right. So I had to know that I'm, I'm good at customer success. I understand business outcomes. I understand the formula of customer experience plus customer outcomes equals customer success. Like that's that's the mantra that we all follow. Right. Yep. But I think there's the practical piece of it, too. Right. You know how you manage your customers. You can build out a good customer success plan. You can actually engage with customers at a personal level and build out good relationships. And if you don't remind yourself of those things, then it becomes really easy to forget about them. Um, so one of the things that I did and um, part of the experience that I had at my last company as an individual contributor was that I really did a good job. I got to meet some really excellent customers. I got on President's Club as one of the few members of the customer success team. Um, by the way, Croatia is beautiful. If you ever get to go visit Croatia, uh, we did a, a President's Club trip to Croatia and it was amazing. But that validated the fact that, look, yes, you know what you're doing, Josh, you can do this work, and it's not something that's beyond your ability, your reasoning, or your, your intelligence. It sounds egotistical, but it's really more just kind of this self, self-help, self self-protection uh, sort of thing that we need to do in some cases. Yeah, I don't think it's, I don't, I don't look at it as egotistical. I look at it as ego-saving. I look at it, you know, yeah. it's, and it's, it, you're just, you're building up your confidence. It's a, it's a confidence booster. You need to be Definitely. confident in yourself. Yep. 
and I, I, I'm not a big fan of the fake it till you make it approach necessarily. Yeah. Everyone always talks about that. And that's a good phrase to use. I, I think it's, it's do until you feel like you actually feel right. Um, you just do the work, right? There's, there's no magic formula to customer success, despite as much as we want to talk about it, right? There's no magic thing that you've got to do regularly. You just got to do the little things. And I tell my team this all the time, the minutia builds up to the actual monument. And when you're, when you're doing the, the minutia, when you're doing it right consistently with some rigor, with some level of formality, then it re really becomes easy for us to actually look back after a while and realize, wow, yeah, I did that. I did a really good job with that. We build, you build up that confidence. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, we, we find that with people who take our courses, they, they build up the confidence because they understand it. They know it. Right. And they know, they know it. And that's, that's, right. that's, that's what it is. That's it's so, but a little, little secret. It's not going to be that big of a secret because I'm going to be mentioning it right now, right here. And everybody's going to hear it. But every once in a while, when I'm about to get on a, on a, on a training call, you know, when I'm doing a boot camp, especially private ones where it's kind of a mis mishmash, I some, it's, it creeps into me a little bit, you know, oh, yeah. and I, I free, I wrote all this content. I lived this for two decades, right. you know, yeah. so it, it, it can creep in, it can creep into anybody Absolutely. at any level. Yep. And, and there's no confidence builder, like quite like just doing stuff, yeah. right? The more you do stuff, the more you get familiar with it. It's the muscle memory. Yeah. Once you get into the actual muscle memory of everything, then it just, it clicks. Things start firing. Everything's the way that you want it to be. And it, it works the way that you expect it to, but it's, it's a practice. You've got to practice being confident. It's not something that just automatically happens. So you got to practice being confident. You got to say to yourself, I know this, mm -hmm. I know how to do this, right? Build up that confidence. Um, you don't want to keep it hidden. You want it. You want to share how you feel and ideally have, have a mentor, have a coach, even have a buddy, have a, have a, even a peer that you can, that you can talk to. So you can okay. talk through this, right? Don't, don't keep it inside. You're not helping anybody. You're not helping yourself or anybody else. And you're not letting anybody else help you. That's right. I, I think we, we tend to glorify this idea that you're going to make it on your own. And you're just going to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you're going to somehow become this hero in your own little story. Yeah. Life really doesn't work that way. And especially not in the business world. We need each other. We need people. We need to collaborate and we need to have good uh, sponsors, mentors, and champions on our side to actually make stuff work. Agreed. Agreed. And yeah, also have to, you have to have a good team. Right? Right. So, I mean, so, so once, once you got past that imposter syndrome, or as you were getting past that imposter syndrome and you were feeling, beginning to feel more confident, you know, how do you then at walking into this new leadership role, which you may be during that time kind of faking it till you make it, how do you manage yeah. down and establish trust with your team? So let's, let's clarify something, right? You never get over imposter syndrome. And then you've actually talked about it just a yeah. few minutes ago, right? Yeah. We never get over that feeling. Right. However, there's a interesting thing that happens. There's a, there's a fine line between when you start feeling like you're more comfortable in your own skin. And then when you get to a point of egotism and when you get to a point of overconfidence and the, the balance is always trying to find that middle road. And I think the way that, that, you know, to your question, right? The way that I interact with my team and the one, the way that I've established trust in a lot of ways is that you told me, you gave me a phrase a little bit before we were talking just today, right? Is there's power in humility. Humility is one of the most powerful things that you'll ever be able to use to, to, to build trust, to build and, and ensure that you actually have the right sort of structure in place with relationships. And as much as I like to be confident in my skill set, I don't know everything. And I'm okay with admitting that I don't know. Um, so, you know, that is probably the first big step is my team did not expect me to know everything, but I told them that I'm willing to help them find whatever they need. I don't know everything, but I can know who to go to. And I think that's the part that I think, you know, it's going to carry you so much further if you're willing to just say, I don't know. 
Yeah. And, and, and also express the fact that you're willing to go seek the help that, that, that you need. It was something is a way that I managed my teams, right? Mm -hmm. My, my job is to provide you with direction, but more importantly, give you what you need to succeed. I need you to tell me that I need you to tell me what it is you need so I can help you secure that. Cause I don't know, or maybe I do, or maybe I know some of it, but right. the, like maybe there's a missing piece. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, it's a team sport, right? We win and lose as a team. That's exactly right. Well, and it's funny, right? So establishing trust with teams, I've found that it doesn't come from my persona or my title, right? My fan club, all the experiences that I've had in my past, like that stuff is all well and good. But in the end, when I'm going to get trust from people, and I've learned this from my kids, right? It doesn't happen because I've done micromanaging or because I've, you know, accomplished something great in myself. What really is going to show trust is that I'm willing to help you be successful. And by you becoming successful, I'm successful. Yep. And, and there, there's three aspects of it. Number one, I mentioned already, no micromanaging. Number two is setting very clear expectations about where we're both going to deliver on things, right? You're going to deliver this for me and I'm going to do something in response. And it's not fully transactional, but it's part of this ongoing, for lack of a better term, this ongoing dance of trust that we build out together in our relationship as coworkers, as manager and, and employee, um, as team members. We have to be collaborative in this experience together. It's never just one-sided. And then the third is communicating even when it feels excessive, right? Sometimes I have a tendency to overshare but I do it in a way to ensure that the, that my team members know where they're going, because the last thing I need is for them to be surprised by something that is going to cause their morale to drop, or that's going to cause them to not have a good experience with customers, or it's going to create barriers in the way that they engage with other team members across the board. And I've been there. I'm sure you have. Yep. If we're not being communicated to effectively and, and with enough detail, it's really easy to get lost in the shuffle and kind of lose your bearings and not really have all the, the right approach to things actually it's really easy to germinate that imposter syndrome am totally. not being communicated yeah. with am i not doing a good job am i not as good as i thought i was exactly right. yeah. yep and i think more than anything else if i can help other people avoid that fud the fear uncertainty and doubt yep. of like is my boss okay with me right is my manager okay with me then i've done my job and, uh, you know, I, I tell my kids too at, at home, like your success is really what I'm striving for. Yeah, I've, of course, as your dad, I'm going to hold you accountable to certain things. But if you're successful and you're actually a good person, you end up being a good person as an adult, then I can consider my job pretty well done. Right. And the yeah. same thing applies with employees, with the team members that you're working with. If you're being successful as an employee, if you're getting your job done and customers are like you feel like you're you're empowered and autonomous enough to be able to go do what needs to get done, you're going to be successful and I'm going to be successful. And there's no, there's no badness about any of that. It's fantastic when that works out that way. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Um, before customer success was, was, a, was a thing before even there was the application service provider. So yeah. a technology that predated SAS, <laughs> you know, I, I was getting, I was, I was in the enterprise software, business. It was all about deploying solutions for our customers. And out of the gate, my, my attitude was always that if I am not getting, giving something of value to our customers, I feel like I failed. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think it's, maybe this is the, so I grew up in a really religious home. Um, pastors, my dad's a pastor. My dad um, was a preacher. So like having some, some of these things just kind of instilled in me very early on, right? We give of ourselves. We, we, we cut off of our own ability and cut off of our own ego so that other people can succeed. And I've known too many people that work in the business world and SaaS in particular, where if the smoke's not rising from their chimney, it's not worth celebrating at all. Right. And I think that that's so that's so undermining to any sort of successes that we can have as a team. And you said it earlier, right? We, we live and we die as a team. We succeed as a team. Yeah. Um, and if we're not doing our parts to contribute to the overall success, then we're not doing our parts and therefore we're not valuable. Um, and we become superfluous to the overall organization. And, and that's the last thing I want for myself or for any of my team members. Yeah.
Well, it's, it's not surprising um, that you're, you're telling me that about your, your upbringing. Uh, you know, it's, it's customer success is a, a high, high emotional quotient business, right? We, you, you, you have to have some, some care, right? Yeah. You, you, you care about the outcomes, right? And yeah. you not only care about the outcomes for your customers, but for your people. Yep. There's a phrase I like to use is like, people don't really care about how much you know, they really, until they know that you care, right? Yeah. So that, that care really, it's kind of the vehicle by which knowledge can be carried. And it's the vehicle by which progress can be made and success can be developed. Um, and then another, another phrase, and my, my team always gets tired of me putting out these little tidbits, right? So it's not our jobs to make people drink. It's our jobs to make people thirsty. Right? So how do we make people thirsty is, is we show that we care. We invest in them emotionally. We invest in them with resources, time, attention, and you know, the power of our, our brand, the power of our product. And um, thankfully enough, I'm at a really cool company where that power is actually very evident, right? So our brand is really strong. The products work really well. I've worked at companies where the product frankly kind of sucks. And I spent more of my time actually apologizing for the product than I did actually doing any sort of successful management. Yeah. And uh, that's tough. It's not but a fun, you, not a fun job. I've been there. I've been there as well. Yeah. Chief apology maker 101. I think that's like the worst thing that you can get into. Yeah. But like when you find that company where there's this kind of like a magical connection between the products, the services, and the people, then all of a sudden there's, there's, there's magic that can be done from a customer success side. That's, that's awesome. And, and so we, we talked about imposter syndrome. We talked about uh, once you're past it, um, managing down uh, to your team, uh, any, any effect um, on managing up? Oh, yeah. how, 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 do, how do you, you know, I mean, when, when you're dealing with that, I mean, it's hard enough. I love the humility, love the humility concept. Uh, but how do, how do you manage up if you're struggling with that? Well, it's, it's kind of interesting, right? And it segues really nicely because the success of my team is dependent on what roadblocks and barriers I can remove as a manager. And sometimes those roadblocks and barriers can actually be others in the organization or even executives or my, my own management, the organizational structure. Like there's so many things that could potentially impact the success of my team members. So the, while we're battling through this idea of like, am I good enough? Am I okay enough? Am I doing my job well enough? And then am I helping my team actually succeed? At a certain point, those two combined together, those two mixed emotions of, am I doing well enough, but I'm also working hard enough for my, for my team, those combine together into a, an imperative, right? I need to go and set the proper expectations to my management to management across the board, to sales directors, to sales leaders, to the chief revenue officer, whatever, and set the expectation that this is potentially gonna be a problem. And I think what's kind of interesting that happens when you get into management, as an individual contributor with customer success, you're managing customers' outcomes and managing their overall success. As a manager, I'm now managing the success of my team. I don't necessarily deal with as many of the customers as I maybe would have wanted to, or maybe that I, I have been in the past. Now my customers are my team members. So therefore I now have to advocate on their behalf internally to my management, to the overall, sometimes it's to HR, sometimes it's to the executives, but it doesn't matter. I'm still taking their primary outcomes, combining it with their experience as CSMs and now trying to create CSM success for their own good, for their own benefit, for their trajectory. Right. They're, they're, they all have desired outcomes. Right. Uh, part, part of those are, are their own personal desired outcomes. Part of those desired outcomes play into your objectives as a, as a leader, the team's objectives as a leader, the company objectives, right? And you've got to, you've, you've got to do both. You got to balance that. Yeah. And you got to do what you need to do to help them achieve what they're trying to achieve on their journey. Yeah. And, and I think one clear truth that always, like, it comes back to me, right? We don't own people, right? So when, when I'm a manager, I'm not, I'm not the, the king that's owning this person that's like in charge of their overall existence, right? That's not the way I view it. We own processes and we own outcomes. 
Right. What ends up happening, though, is that those people facilitate those outcomes, they facilitate those processes, they leverage the tools that are available to them. And what we do is we own the experience around the people that are doing the job. So if we can shift our mindset from these people report to me and I own them, I'm responsible for their all, all end all be all, right? right? And shift that to I'm responsible to them. I'm responsible for them. I'm going to help them achieve their goals, regardless if it's in customer success or not, right? There may be one of your team members that wants to move over to sales, over to product, over to marketing, whatever. It's not our job to, to tell them no. It's our job to say, all right, the things that we can help you to facilitate your success, let's do those things, right? Now, all that said, we still have to hold people accountable. Right. Yeah, they're still course. deliverable. There's still KPIs. There's still things and objectives that we need to lead uh, to deliver on. But in the end, keep that relationship at a at a proper level. Treat people as humans. Treat people as as individuals with their own desires, their own wishes, dreams, aspirations, and then respect those. Make sure that they're helping them succeed. Well, like you said, you got to treat them like your customers, right? Okay. They have a desired outcome. Customer success is desired outcome plus the journey. That we're going to you right and it's the same thing with your employees all right let's do what we need to do to help them achieve those goals love That's it exactly. well awesome. and, and then the 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 carry through the follow along on that is you know managing upwards is setting really clear expectations right um it's not just a matter of escalating and asking for help it's sometimes setting the expectation that there might be a risk down the road if we go down this path um, and much like, so I, I view customer success as a tripart unicorn. I've, I've told you this before, right? Good technical acumen, good sales understanding so that they can find opportunities. And that third one is the one that I'm going to talk about a little bit. It's that consultative skill. Mm -hmm. So when we see risks, when we see opportunities or when we see threats to anybody's success, including our employees, our team members, then we need to call those out. And sometimes we need to escalate that upwards to ensure that there's some visibility on that more than just our own, like, hey, my own perception. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I'm not seeing the whole picture. Maybe I'm stuck at the, at the trees and not able to see the forest. So I need that visibility from my management, from my executives to ensure that we're helping our team members succeed with the, with the customers that they're assigned. It's, it's a work in progress for sure. It's and always a work in progress. End. We exactly. never finish. This. Never finish. It's that fly. It's that constant. It's just like we do in customer success. It's constant, right. constant yep. selling, positioning, value realization doesn't end. We don't want it to end. Yep. Right. Yep. Awesome. Josh, thank you. Thanks for the time. It's great. Yeah, great pleasure. conversation. I enjoyed it. Good seeing you. We'll have you on the program again. Sounds good. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it.